How do humanities two, humanities four, sorry. I'm teaching another humanities class, not to get them mixed up. Humanities four through film studies. How's everybody doing? Are you getting your, your uh, on the waterfront, rebel without a cause, essays finished up? Good. Because I'm going to sign another one today. Not due till next week, though, so don't worry about it yet. Um, I'll put it on the assignments. You're going to watch uh, a French New Wave film. You're going to either watch, it's up to you, it's your choice. You can watch um, Jean-Luc Godard's um, Breathless, or you can watch Francois Truffaut's 400 Blows and write your critical essays about the, either one of those films. Go deep. It's not a review. Do some research. Watch the films. You're going to have to watch the films, folks. Uh, that's why you get a whole week to do it. Uh, I'll post all this later so you'll have it. Um, it's going to take some discipline and some viewing skills that maybe you've never used because they have subtitles. Yes, folks, subtitles. And uh, they're both totally different films made in roughly the same area, 1959-60, in France. The French New Wave, which I discussed already on Monday, and I showed you a documentary. Now you're going to look at the film and write about them. Have you ever seen a foreign film? Have you ever seen a film we had to read subtitles? Good. If you haven't, this is your first one. You're lucky to, to discover these brilliant films any time in your life. They're game changers. They changed the industry. They changed how Americans thought about cinema. That's how important they were. Are. Anyway, that's going to be the assignment. You'll see it posted later on. Now we're getting into... 1960, 61, 62, in the world cinema. Uh, things are popping in Britain. Uh, there's a new movement over there, which is has a couple of names, but kitchen sink drama is one of them, which simply means they don't have the budget and the money to make uh, big budgeted flights of fancy like Hollywood does. And uh, so they have to make more realistic dramas. And so... Uh, a lot of it is based around the kitchen or people being behaving in a normal way like we all do. Um, you don't see a lot of kitchen sink dramas in old Hollywood because they're too glamorous and they kind of hide all that life. After post-World War II, things changed because of Italian neorealism and because the war changed all of us. And so there was a desire to make a more realistic, naturalistic looking um, cinema that reflected who we are, not just a fantasy of who we dreamed about being or something. Now, think about cinema now, folks. Look at your, most of your fa fantasy films. It's all about fantasy. Yes, there's some realistic films that slip through, but mostly the big box Busters or the X-Men or Spider-Man, or not, now Batman just opened. This is not real cinema. This is, this is cinema, but it's not what you would call kitchen sink drama. It's good fighting bad and capes. Why the cape? I understand Superman. He supposedly needed it to fly, but he doesn't really. Batman certainly doesn't need it to fly. He doesn't fly. But they all have capes. It seems like it would get in the way, but... I'm being picky about it. Uh, anyway, so that's where we are right now. In British cinema, there was a couple of uh, films that were very, very important. Uh, Room at the Top, Sunday, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Loneliness of a Long Distance Runner, The Sporting Life, Look Back in Anger. There was a a time in British theater. There's a play tonight, right named John Osborne, who wrote a play called Look Back in Anger. And it's just three people living in an apartment. And the 
they're not happy with their lives, folks, um, because things aren't going the way they want them to, and their dreams look like they're not going to be ever fulfilled. And so um, the main character who was who was played in the film by Richard Burton um, is working a dead-end job. He's in love, but he can't figure out how to make it work. How's he going to ever buy a house or fulfill his dreams? It's not easy. It's rather a bleak film. And that kind of started this whole movement that they referred to as angry young men movie, movies. Then women were angry too, folks. Women were angry in Saturday night, Sunday morning. The guy, Albert Finney, is brilliant in it. He's working a dead-end job in a factory producing ball bearings, useless things that he knows there's no future, but he's living in a uh, an area of England that doesn't have much hope to busting out of that reality, and he wants to have Saturday night. What do you do on Saturday night, folks? When Saturday comes and the whistle blows, for, the work is over, you go home, you shower, you shave, and you go out to the clubs. And you drink and dance and hopefully meet somebody that you could be intimate with. Well, he is intimate with a woman who gets pregnant. This is very adult material for the times because they aren't married. And in cinema, Hollywood cinema, you better be married if you're having sex. Um, and how is he going to deal with this? All his dreams are dashed, but her dreams are dashed also because the woman has got to bear the burden of having the child. Yes, there were illegal abortions that were dangerous and considered rather a seedy affair. and Or you have the baby and marry the guy who you might not even like because you, had, you got drunk on a one-night stand. What do you do? Do you do the right thing and marry and get a job and live happily ever after? That doesn't happen, folks. Does not happen. And these films depicted that. The bleakness of the existence and their lives was such a refreshing breath of fresh air away from the Hollywood fantasy that everybody looks beautiful. Everybody falls in love, and nobody's hurt. There is plenty of pain in these films. Uh, loneliness of a long-distance runner, a guy who was like Tony Richardson, the director who directed several of these films. He um, is a guy who's in and out of trouble, but he's good at one thing, running. Long distance. And so he's, he's the guy out there running, perhaps training for some event that will take him out of this miserable town he's living in. Maybe it'll get him a future somehow, but it doesn't look like he, folks, because it's called the loneliness of a long-distance runner. <laughs> uh, the ups and downs of a young man trying to outrun his his own social stratosphere and he's trying to run into a brighter future will it happen won't it happen watch the movie and find out uh, other movies that were uh coming up at the time uh, lindsey anderson one of my favorite all-time directors british directors who didn't direct that many films but the one that really put him on the map came out in about 63 or 4 uh, with uh, Richard Harris, who was an up-and-coming kind of the Marlon Brando of, of the Great Britain, who actually became very uh, well-known later in American films. Uh, but he wasn't so well-known yet. And uh, he, he in the movie, it's called The Sporting Life. He... Um, once again, is trying to bust out of his mundane existence in a mundane 
coal mining town in England. Uh, he is a rugby player, which is not to be confused with soccer <coughs> because it's really rough sport. You ever seen rugby played? It's all, it's very similar sort of than our football, except for they don't have pads or helmets. They just tackle each other, and they wear shorts and sweatshirts. Um, and he's the man. So he's that good. He has a future. He's getting paid a little something. So he's kind of a, a, a sporting star. And that gets him in trouble because he's kind of a jerk. And he gets in trouble with different women. And the husbands of these different men and women. And there is not going to be a decent way out of this life. Um, later on, Lindsay Anderson directed If, one of the greatest anti-war movies ever made, Oh Lucky Man. And I'll stop it there because unless you seek him out, you'll never see these films. They're that brilliant. But they weren't blockbusters at your local cinema. They were considered art films. Anyway, whenever they call a film an art film, it's it means you have to think about it. <laughs> they don't give out easy answers. Um, and a man who might be the 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 forefather, at least the godfather of art films, is an actor, director, writer named John Cassavetes, who was a very successful Hollywood actor, even had a TV series in the very, very early 60s, late 50s, and who went on to act in one of the biggest horror movies of all times, Rosemary's Baby. He was in another big blockbuster movie called The Dirty Dozen with Lee Marvin, a war film. And But he had the passion to direct his own films. How do you do that when you don't have much money? Well, he went out with his friends in New York City on the streets, like the French New Wave and like Italian neorealism, and he filmed out there where real people live. There's a movie called Shadows about people living in New York, trying to be artists, musicians, trying to get by, trying to survive their life and trying to fulfill their dreams. And it's very similar to watching The 400 Blows or Bicycle Thieves in that you won't know the actors, but they're all his acting buddies who were in, in acting classes in New York. Some of them went on to become relatively famous movie stars, if that's important to you. Um, but he decided, I want to make my own movies. So he took a 16 millimeter camera and mostly couldn't film real sound because he didn't have the equipment. And the, he did a feature film. He was a pioneer of what we now call independent filmmaking. At the same time, there was a, others trying to do that. Andy Warhol was one of them. Maybe you've heard of Warhol as a painter, uh, provocateur. Uh, you've seen probably funny pictures of him with a ridiculous rig on. Uh, but he got tired of, he got famous for doing the Campbell soup cans. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we're going to get to this. Actually, not in this class. I'm getting my classes mixed up. That's in my other class where we go into Warhol. But Warhol said, I'm a filmmaker now. He had a camera, and he filmed some incredibly interesting films. Uh, but they were so far underground that very few people saw these films. They're mostly shown as the backdrops in nightclubs or in small, tiny theaters somewhere, somebody's basement. Um, one of his films uh, shows a, a guy sleeping eight hours. There's a, that's all you see, folks. You can look at it on YouTube. I don't think the whole eight hours is there, but part of it is. He essentially, Warhol just point the camera at somebody. He did one called uh, Empire State Building, uh, and he shot the Empire State Building in New York. 
during 24 hour period, and the film is 24 hours long, folks. One camera angle. That's all it is. Now his camera only took five to 10 minute rolls. And so he had to switch films out, film stock out a lot. Then he made some provocative films with his underground friends, like people in the Velvet Underground. This is being the mid 60s. And Edie Sedgwick and Nick, Nico and the rest. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a rich vein of material for anybody interested in alternative cinema. And yes, he did some graphic cinema, meaning graphic sex acts. Acts, Yes, he did. Um, they didn't call him porn in those days. There's nothing sexy about these films, folks. Um, but they're provocative and they show a window into the mirror of a certain part of our culture that was thriving in areas like New York and L.A. and San Francisco, art centers, with people striving to do something more with their lives than trying to make a slick Hollywood movie, okay? And so Warhol's important that way. Um, did he know how to tell a story? Did he know how to write dialogue? No, he did not. But you can't take your eyes off this stuff. Is it boring? Yes, it is. Is it interesting, exciting, all of that? Did any of these make movies? Actually, he did. A Chelsea Girls made mo some money for him. Uh, it played in a couple theaters. And people actually paid to see it. Anyway, then there was a woman named Shirley Clark who was um, kind of a trust fund girl. And she wanted to make films. And so a play was playing off, off, off Broadway called um, The Connection in New York City in the 50s. The connection is about half a dozen heroin junkies waiting for their dealer to show up, their connection. And they're being filmed by a documentary film crew. So she got enough money to make a very nice looking 35 millimeter film. Uh, it's on. You can watch the whole thing on YouTube for free. The Connection. And all the guys in the movie, a lot of them portray a jazz. Jazz was a big deal in the 50s in New York. And so this these guys in this, a lot of them are jazz musicians in real life. And they actually play jazz throughout the play on stage. And it was a revolutionary play that got closed down several times because rumor has it they were actually shooting up heroin on stage. We know, we'll never know if that's true or not. And the cops shut it down. And so it had this, this uh, notoriety, this underground notoriety, but it's a very sharp looking black and white film um, filmed on 35 millimeter. Shirley Clark was, a, was early, early adopter of underground independent cinema. Um, but John Cassavetes, who went on to do his brilliant work in such movies as his Faces and Gloria and Woman Under the Influence, he uh, kept acting. He would act to make money, and then he put all his acting fees into movies that he would make with his friends. Out in, mostly in L.A., and his wife, Gene Rollins, and she starred in most of them, and they worked for free, of course. And he filmed at his friends' houses with his friends who were actors like Ben Gazar and Peter Falk, who were incredible actors. And Gene Rollins, incredible actor, just nominated for Academy Award and Woman Under the Influence. His films look improvised, improvised. They were scripted, but he has a way of filming that it makes it look like it's not scripted, like it's actually happening. Um, he used to shoot a lot of film to get what he needed. He kept the camera rolling.
He never shut the camera off. And he filmed most of these films in 35 millimeter, some in black and white, a lot of them in color. And he kept going till he died early in the 1980s of, of uh, cancer. Oh, liver failure, that's what it was. It was, it was an alcoholic liver failure. Um, John Cassavetes, a revolutionary independent filmmaker who broke all the rules and was pretty successful at it. By Hollywood standards, no. But by artistic standards, absolutely. So then we have those. This is all happening from 60 to 65 or so. In the midst of all that change, Hollywood is still trying to drag its feet. They're still trying to figure out the marketplace. They're making kind of big bloated movies like Cleopatra uh, and uh, religious movies like uh, Greatest Story We're Told, Ben-Hur, because they're trying to capture what television couldn't because television had um, siphoned off a huge amount of the audience. Hollywood's trying to get them back into the theaters, whereas these, these French New Wave theater um, movie directors, these British, they, they weren't thinking of that because they only had the money to do what they could do. And they were just hoping any audience would see it. And, and it did. It these films I mentioned today have become a worldwide phenomenon that made Hollywood look of, of the possibilities of the, what would be called independent film, a small film, angry young man film, kitchen sink drama. And it started to trickle into American films. Not quite yet, though. In the meantime, there was a phenomenon in England by a rock group, the Beatles. The Beatles were a huge influence on the new emerging cinema of what was possible. They were bringing in a uplifting, joyful sound that even our parents liked because they were they wore suits and ties and they were good lads well they also decided to film a movie of that experience called a hard day's night in 1964 um, richard lester was the director he's an american but he was an expatriate living there and he's still living there uh he's made a couple of Beatles movies help also he made in other films in his career. But this was a new uh, style of filmmaking. It was fun. It was light. Yes, it's a black and white, but look at some of the clips from, if we're in class right now, I'd show you clips from Hard Day's Night. It's, it's a spontaneous, fun looking film. And, um, full of exuberance, youthful exuberance, and wonderful music. And the film looks just like the phenomenon known as Beatlemania. And um, he essentially filmed the lads in their natural environment of what was happening in their lives at the time. This also captured the youth market young people were starting to look for their stories in films. They weren't seeing them in some of these Hollywood films or in Hollywood television. And I'm talking about essentially my generation. We're all 10 and 12 years old. We're the films that we could relate to. Well, we saw some possibilities in Cassavetes and Warhol and The Sporting Life and loneliness of a long-distance runner that we could relate to. And then all of a sudden, there we have it with the Beatles, which we all wanted to be. Male and female. Because it looked a lot of fun. More fun than we were having. And so all of a sudden, this youth market started to bubble up. Some studios were still slow to to see the youth market, but there was some visionary 
visionary producers and future filmmakers. One of them was Roger Corman. And he started make he saw a market. The drive-in movie was a huge thing during this time. One time there was something like eight or nine thousand drive-in movies throughout the United States. Have you ever been to a drive-in? Well, there was a market specifically for the drive-ins, and he tried to fulfill that by making two or three different science kinds of film, low-budget horror films. Uh, which were mostly uh, Edgar Allan Poe films starring um, um, <laughs> oh come on I'm gonna forget his name anyway I'll come back to it um, Vincent Price who was a straight Hollywood actor all his life until his, his career started going downhill and Corman could get him for cheap he got other horror film actors that were popular in the 30s and 40s like. Boris Karloff and and others to be in his movies. He would pay him a little here and a little there, so their careers would keep going. And these were mostly marketed to these drive-ins. I want you guys to watch this little documentary on drive-in movies. How I'll, I'll post it up there. You'll see it. The the, the concept Corman came up with was biker films. Motorcycle bike films, Hell's Angels, were becoming a big popular thing. They're the outlaws in America. They look cool on these bikes. They had cool-looking girlfriends, and they were outlaws. They were living outside the law. And so he decided to make a series of these films, one of them which they're all based on the first one, which made my Marlon Brando called The Wild One in the 1950s. Uh, it looked like interesting lifestyle. It's not a nine to five job, picket fence type of lifestyle. It's I'm an outlaw. I'm living outside the society's norm. And Roger Corman is the father of essentially a movie that changed everything. I'm not going to talk about it today, next week. Uh, Easy Rider. Uh, but before then, he made several low budget biker films. And. Um, and, and most of them, for the most part, were very successful. Wild Angels was his key movie that he made. I don't want to go into that yet because I'm going to get into that next week. But so there's a smart producer out there who's seeing what the kids want to see. Parents didn't want to see this stuff. Then there was another uh, set of producers, American uh, American films, uh who were started to see that kids love rock and roll and they love the beach. And so they made beach party movies. Yes. That's what they were called. Most of them started in net Fulincello, who was a former Musketeer, and Frankie Avalon and the rest. And they made half a dozen of these films from 63 or so to 67. And to fulfill this drive in youth market, Fun in the surf and the sand with some really nice swing and rock and roll to accompany their surfing and their really innocent sexual shenanigans. They don't show sex, folks, because it's still the good, clean times in Hollywood. But the girls were wearing bikinis and the guys were wearing swim trunks and we knew what was going on, but we didn't know, not really because they didn't show any of that vulgarity like they do now. And then they, then he had a nice backbeat with it, and then let's go surfing. How fun. It was the California dream uh, before it all got destroyed uh, later on the Vietnam War, etc. But that's another story. So beach party movies were uh, Samuel Arkoff and his, his people were smart. They knew how to market to the youth market. Hollywood didn't know how to get their money. They were clueless. We're going to go into that further detail. Not today. So look for your last, uh, your next assignment, which is going to be writing about one of these French New Wave films due next week. I'm going to be out of town till Saturday. So if you need to get a hold of me, you have to do it through text. I'm not even going to have my computer with me. So. Can you make it without me for two days? 
keep reading the book. In the book, <coughs> the textbook, you should, if you read chapter seven, if you read from 267 to 300, <coughs> pardon my cough, and that's going to cover this area I'm covering today. And if you look at the other textbook, the little one writing about movies, who has it? Because I could tell who has and who hasn't. Uh, go to chapter six. It's called Researching Movies. That's right. You're not just watching the movies. You're going to research them. How to use sources. How to summarize your sources without stealing their words. How to categorize your sources. Meaning, what is the genre of the movie you're you're writing about. For example, Rebel Without a Cause. What genre would you call that? What, what would you call On the Waterfront? You have to go deeper and read this stuff and you'll find out how to categorize things and how to in, integrate your sources into your essay. And, I mean, look at how to annotate, annotate. This is essentially how to write any research paper. You need to know this stuff. And how to make the sources work for you. So, and your source right now, if you do independent, independent uh, research on your films, which I hope you do, so you just, just don't go to Wikipedia, go to other sources. Wikipedia will do, I guess, but don't copy and paste anything from there. Thank you. And, and then look at the movie with those eyes, with your eyes, thinking critically all the time, taking notes. Why is James Dean in the early part of the film dressed in a suit and tie? And then when he becomes more like James Dean, the rock and roll rebellious hero, he's looking cooler. The red jacket and the T-shirt. The Levi's, that's the uniform of rebellion, folks. And that's the kind of stuff you should notice. It is called Rebe Rebel Without a Cause. But actually, he has a lot of causes. On the Waterfront is a mature story about Terry Malloy trying to exist in a very volatile area where the mafia controls Shipping and how he's trying to figure out where he fits in and be a decent guy. And it's not easy. What genre would you call that? And drama and comedy is technically not a genre. You could start with that. What are the themes? Loyalty. Status. People who have nothing, people who have too much. Danger. What are the themes in Rebel Without a Cause? Parenting versus teenagers running wild because the parents don't get them. Loyalty, family, trying to find an identity. Hope you guys are writing about that stuff and hope you're getting it. Thanks. And I'll talk to you later where the story film continues.